Welcome to online worship here at University United Methodist Church in Austin, Texas. Whether this is your first time joining us or you watch every week, hear this reminder. Whomever you are and wherever you are on your faith journey or your life journey, you are welcome here. And I'm so glad you decided to join us here today. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Hi, my name is Teresa Wellborn, and I'm the senior pastor here at University UMC in the heart of Austin, Texas. I want you to know that I'm so glad that you've made the decision to be in worship with us this day. Whether you are a longtime member who enjoys worshiping online, or whether you're a first time or second time guest or visitor, I'm glad you're here. And I want all of you to know that as always, if you have a pastoral care need or simply need a listening ear, myself, our associate pastor, Earl Kim, as well as Megan Otto, we are available to you. You can find our contact information online. As well, for any visitors among us, if you have, if, if you have questions and are interested in learning more about UUMC, I hope that you wouldn't hesitate to reach out to any of us here on staff. Again, you can find our contact info on our website. I'm glad you're here on this Sunday when we continue a sermon series on hope that's inspired in part by a book entitled Hope is Here, written by a seminary professor named Luther Smith. We also continue our Lenten journey as we journey with Jesus through the wilderness to the cross and ultimately to Easter Sunday morning. We know that this is a time of turning inward and seeing how God might be at work in our lives to grow us in love of God, neighbor, and self. And so in that spirit, I share with you this prayer of confession. May we pray. Holy and gracious God, at times we feel so frail and fragile, getting blown about by the latest crisis, by bad news, by our own short tempers and failings. You call us to hold fast to what is good, but so often we flounder, unable to find that solid thing that will center us again. Help us, we pray. Help us to see you as our center and to cling to the good that you create in the world. Help us to set aside all within us that adds to the world's hurt and set us free for a life of joy and service. Amen. And now hear the good news, the very best news of all. In turning to God, we find unconditional love and forgiveness. Thanks be to God. At this time, let us join together with Alicia as they lead us in song.
Friends, hear now our scripture from Mark 8, 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we have this sermon series on hope, and there is so much to be said about hope. And based on the conversations I've had with many of you, including the great insights shared at the Linton study last Sunday after worship, um, you as a church are well acquainted with the beauty of this word, hope. You are also familiar with the complexity and uneasiness of this thing called hope, given the reality of where we find ourselves these days. I like the way Luther Smith puts it in his book, Hope is Here. He writes, rather than fulfilling our wishes, hope makes demands of us. You as a church have lived these words for decades upon decades, and you continue to live them out. Instead of a self-centered, wishful sort of hope, you embrace a hope that is oriented towards the common good. Or as another writer put it, hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. You know such a hope is complex. Complex because it's not always easy, immediate, or evident. The disciples in today's lesson, they had hopes, expectations about the type of Messiah Jesus would be hopes about how things would turn out for him and for them. So much to be said about hope. In looking to these sermons and considering the vastness of this subject, I began thinking of hope as it pertains to our personal lives, to the church, and to the wider world. So this morning, I'll be looking more at what it means to have hope for ourselves. Next week, hope for the future of the church, and the week after that, hope for the world. Certainly there will, there will be some overlap as our oscillating feelings of despair and hope about our own circumstances are no doubt connected to the despair and hope we feel for the world. But for today, I'm, I'm going to invite you to consider the things that might be difficult or painful in your own life, if there are any such things. As a church, even in a church, when the pastor is speaking a lot about the daily news cycle with its grim reporting, we might need reminding that it is okay to take space and time to focus on our own suffering. Just because there are overwhelming and devastating things taking place in the world doesn't mean that your own suffering is insignificant. You are of great importance and what you are going through matters. Dr. Pauline Boss is a professor, professor emeritus at the University of Minnesota, and is a fellow in the area of psychology at the American Psychological Association. It was back in the 1970s that Dr. Boss first coined the term ambiguous loss. The research behind ambiguous loss reminds us that grief is about death, and so much more. A lot of experiences in life can feel like loss, certainly including death, but not just death. Moving to another city, a job change, being diagnosed with a chronic illness, loving someone who has been diagnosed with cognitive impairment, a child moving out of the house, the list goes on. Maybe there's not been a death, and maybe on the outside people would assume you look the same and are the same, 
but inside you are reeling with emotions that are as wide and deep as the grief journey itself. It's ambiguous because sometimes it's hard for others to put their finger on or even for you yourself to name. You just know that something's changed, something is different, and it feels like loss. Even in the church, there can be changes that feel like loss and grief to us, whether it's a pastoral transition or not having as many people in attendance as we did in the 1980s. Change can feel like loss and grief and make us sad. Well, in recent years, Dr. Boss has been interviewed time and time again about her work in the area of ambiguous loss, in large part, I think, because it was during the pandemic that we began understanding and experiencing this type of loss at a deeper level. If you think to yourself, what is wrong with me? I shouldn't be feeling so down. The losses I'm experiencing are nothing compared to the pain in the wider world. Well, if you're thinking such things, Dr. Boss will validate your feelings and remind you that loss of any kind is real and difficult. The disciples in today's lesson are also going through a type of sadness. Some professionals would call it ambiguous, I'm sorry, anticipatory grief. Anticipatory grief as Jesus tells them that he will soon face his own death. Now, I think it's important for us to pause and remember that especially for those of us who have been raised in the church, we are accustomed to this news of Jesus's crucifixion. So it's easy for us to overlook how jarring this news must have been for the early disciples. They had hopes after all. Jesus' miracles, his magnetic personality, the healings and the teachings all worked to foster that hope. They looked to this new type of leader and they had hoped that this leader would set them free from the oppressive Roman Empire. And now this, a talk of being killed Jesus shocks them, causing dismay with this news that he will undergo suffering and death. There are any number of sermons and certainly no end to books written on Jesus' death, why he died, important stuff for us to wrestle with. But today I'm thinking of those disciples and all their dashed hopes, ambiguous loss and anticipatory grief. Peter himself is so distraught with this news that he rebukes Jesus, saying, this must not happen to you. Well, Jesus pushes back harder, so hard that he calls Peter Satan. And on an academic and theological level, I get it. Jesus is wanting to emphasize that his type of messiahship runs counter to the ways of the world and that it will most certainly involve suffering. But on a pastoral and human level, I sympathize with Peter. His heartache has already begun. A couple of lessons from modern day teachers for us modern day disciples. Father Richard Rohr. Father Richard Rohr is a Catholic priest and he says over and over again that if we do not transform our pain, we transmit it. In other words, do the good soul work that opens your pain to the possibility of being transformed. In other words, don't deny your pain, Roar, Roar would say. Allow yourself to feel all the feels because that is the only way to heal. It's the only way forward. Like Peter, we must be willing to allow Jesus to be who he is, the one who suffers and experiences pain. And likewise, we must give ourselves permission to experience pain and sadness when there is loss and suffering. Recently, I watched the movie Good Grief, and a man not only in this movie not only loses his husband to death, but his grief is compounded by additional losses. At one point in the movie, someone says to avoid sadness is also to avoid love. And we don't want to avoid love, right? Resources like a good therapist will likely come in handy as we look to transform rather than transmit our pain. But there is no sugarcoating grief work, and there's no crash course to get you through it quicker. 
Another Catholic priest, Father Boyle, founded Home Boy Industries, the largest gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program in the world. He had such compassion for gang members who had committed all sorts of hideous crimes. His compassion stems from the understanding that they didn't have the tools to transform their pain, so they only knew how to transmit it. The abuser became the abuser. I'm sorry, the abused became the abuser, and that cycle continued. They transmitted their pain. At Homeboy Industries, people are transformed because they are given the space and the permission and the tools to finally transform their pain. The cycle of abuse stops and a new way of living emerges. When Dr. Boss herself speaks of ambiguous loss, she also reminds us of the myth of closure. In other words, to say that we are going to get over a death or a loss is not realistic. It's just the unhelpful narrative of our Western mindset that this is another task to accomplish so that we can move on. That's why it's called ambiguous loss, because the process of healing can feel unclear and directionless. She shares a very touching story about someone who felt their pain transformed in time, and I wanna share it with you. Dr. Boss, um, earlier in her career, she met with a number of people who had lost loved ones on the tragedy of 911. And there was this one woman in particular, a very young woman who was left behind with a newborn when her husband died in the Twin Towers. This woman kept blaming herself for her husband's death because she did not wake him up early enough that morning. You see, her husband had an alarm clock and it didn't go off that day. Usually when his alarm clock went off, he was at the trade towers by um, 8 a.m. and he would be out by 9 a.m. But on this dreadful day, it happened that he was late. And so he was in the trade towers when it went down. For months and months, Dr. Boss met with this young woman and she was understandably at her wit's end every time they met, crying, blaming herself, an agony and heartache that was gut-wrenching. Over a year later, the woman looked at Dr. Boss and said, you know this story that I've told you over and over about my husband oversleeping and how I kept saying it was my fault? Yes, I remember, she replied. Well, he was the one that always set the alarm clock. I realized that finally, it wasn't my fault. He just wanted another hour to be with us. Ah, oh, now that's the work of transformation. The loss and the pain, it is still there, but it is held in a different way. He wanted another hour to be with us. That sort of transformation work takes time. And it's also the work of resurrection. Jesus speaks today of his own suffering. Indeed, he does. And the words are so off-putting that the disciples can hardly hear the rest of the story, that he will rise again. And this is the type of hope the world cannot give. It comes as grace. It comes as a gift. And it comes as a surprise, allowing us to hold our losses in a way that is a little less stressful, a little more gentle, in a way that enables us to go on living. One final word from Anne Lamont. She wrote on hope in the National Geographic a few years ago, and she put it this way. She writes at regular intervals, life gets a little too real for my taste. The wider world seems full of bombers, polluters, threats of all kinds. My own small world suffers ruptures, a couple of deaths, a couple of breakups, a young adult who had me scared out of my wits for a couple of years, it all leaves me struggling to stay on my feet. In these situations, I usually have one of two responses, either that I'm completely doomed or that I need to figure out who to blame and then correct their behavior. But neither of these is true. The truth is that through the workings of love, science, community, time, and what I dare to call grace, some elemental shift will occur and we will find that we are semi-okay again and even semi-okay
can be a miracle. I think the young woman whose husband died was able to say that she was finally semi-okay again. It took time to get there. I pray that you, friends, are semi-okay, or maybe even more than okay. If not, I stand with you in the hope of resurrection. Amen. Friends, now hear this prayer from Cole Arthur Riley. God of solidarity, thank you for being a God who enters the suffering of the world, who doesn't run from those in pain, but rushes to the sight of blood, of tears. Release us from empty cravings of unity that come at no cost to the oppressor and guide us toward a solidarity that demands something of us. Let us learn to risk ourselves on behalf of the vulnerable, believing that when one of us is harmed, we all are. Help us to remember that justice and liberation are not a scarcity and that our survival and dignity are wrapped up in one another. And God, keep us from those who will demonize the fight in us, who would prefer us complacent and far from one another. Secure in us the courage to stand, knowing together we will restore what the world has tried to suffocate in us. Amen. this day is to continue to live our lives seeking the hope that only Christ can give. I also invite you friends, if you haven't lately, to um, spend some time checking out our website to find out about different ministries and programs you may want to connect with. Again, I'm so glad that you are here and I'm grateful for all that you do for the purposes of Christ in this world. Thank you especially for your generosity financially that enables us to continue to be a place of unconditional love and justice in action. A reminder that this year's Lenten special offering goes to UT Outpost at the University of Texas campus. This place provides a food pantry that is free for food insecure university students. We are so excited to partner with UT Austin in this way. And now friends, as you go forth this day, I share with you this benediction. May the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Go in peace, amen.